Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the spring lecture series of the Peace Dale Museum of Art and Culture. Um, I'm going to ask everyone to turn off your video and mute yourself during the program because it saves bandwidth and it will prevent us from having um, unnecessary or, or um, um, uh, disruptive background noise. And after the program is finished, you'll be able to ask a question. Um, but during the program, it would be really helpful if um, everybody stays um, on mute and with the video off. Mm -hmm. I am going to turn this over now to Lisa Fiore, who is the president of our board of trustees. Thank you, Karen. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Peace Steel Museum of Art and Culture. I'm Lisa Fiore, President of the Board of Trustees. Museum work is enjoyable and rewarding because I work with a wonderful group of like-minded individuals who volunteer to keep history alive and well. It is my pleasure to announce our newest trustee, Donna Grady, who happens to be a lifelong friend, fellow URI anthropology graduate, and who has worked decades as the IT manager with PAL, the Public Archaeology Lab. Together, we are tasked with preserving and sharing with the public this 129-year-old international and multicultural collection. A visit to our museum gallery is certainly worth the trip. Kudos to Karen Ellsworth, fellow trustee and creator of our terrific newsletter for another interesting spring lecture series. Please know that this lecture, <laughs> along with presentations from last fall, have been recorded and are available on our museum website, peacedalemuseum.org. Anyone not on our museum mailing list but would like to be, please email us and we will add you to our constant contact and newsletter list. We have a new lecturer to our museum tonight, Timothy Ives, an archaeologist with extensive archaeological experience, who is an avid researcher and an author of numerous publications. Tonight's presentation will again focus on the New England landscape. Tim will be presenting related facts, patterns, and ideas regarding the history of stone heaps commonly found in New England's forested hills. Let's welcome Timothy Ives to the Peace Dale Museum of Art and Culture Spring Zoom presentation as he shares his research findings with us. Welcome, Tim. All right. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. That was wonderful. Um, and yeah, thank you all for tuning in. I especially thank Karen Ellsworth for giving me the opportunity to participate in the museum spring programming concerning a fascinating topic. Like most of my talks, please note that this one does not represent the views or positions of my employer. Since I'm talking about history and culture, I'll share some of my key working assumptions in those arenas. First, I don't see history as a story about good guys versus bad guys, but as an interplay between complicated people. And seeing that human pasts are filled with misunderstanding, conflict, and suffering, it seems obvious to me that the best way to avoid the needless repetition of such to have a very clear and shared understanding of the conditions that brought them about. Therefore, inventing history, even with noble intentions, risks robbing future generations of valuable perspectives on reality. And I insist that one of the greatest legacies of colonialism is to romanticize Native Americans, which distorts views of their pasts and deprives them of their full humanity in the present. This is a history of the origins and interpretations of the stone heaps so commonly found throughout New England's forested hills. <clears throat> in part one, I lay out my case that most were probably generated by 19th century farmers. In part two, I explain how stone heaps and related farm infrastructure became reinterpreted as Native American ceremonial property and how a modern social movement has come to celebrate that concept. Hopefully there will be time for questions afterward. Um, this will probably take just a little under an hour, just so you know what to expect. Tribal authorities and antiquarians often identify old stone heap sites as elements of ceremonial stone landscapes. Archaeologists often interpret the same as signatures of used and abused farmlands. I'm in the, the latter camp, 
uh, though it is not a fashionable camp to occupy, now that the study and preservation of these sites has come to be thought of as a Native American social justice cause and perhaps an anti-racist mission. Though I strongly support the preservation of such sites, I remain convinced that most have agricultural origins, and not out of ignorance. I've researched this position from many angles. Most recently in 2018, when I searched 19th century journals and newspapers for accounts of farmers building stone heaps. I wanted to see if it was true that no such accounts exist, which has been a chronic claim among ceremonial stone landscape proponents. I found that such accounts do exist and that they offer modest insights into a widespread rural practice that is completely dropped from our collective memory. To understand when and why stone heaping became widely practiced, a broad brush overview of agricultural history is necessary. Colonists began establishing farmsteads in Southern New England's interior hills in the late 17th century following King Philip's War. Endowed with considerable timber reserves, for building, fencing, and fuel, these farms operated through much of the 18th century with little reason to consider sustainability. It's usually encompassed under 100 acres, were economically self-sufficient, and produced few market products. But a generation of young farmers brought up during the post-revolutionary war baby boom was determined to meet, if not exceed, their parents' success. In the opening years of the 19th century, they finished subdividing the interior into a rolling tapestry of farms and soon ran headlong into sustainability issues as wood, land, and good soil grew scarce. Farming the deforested hills invited soil degradation, particularly from 1810 to 1840, when wool production became a principal venture. During this time, sheep flocks expanded, as did the number of small wool processing mills, contributing to a so-called sheep fever or wool craze. It was an economic boom that nobody today remembers. This trend was most pronounced during the 1830s, a decade dubbed the golden era of sheep raising. In 1853, a seasoned farmer recalled the economic rationale of those days when one would profit better from converting his old fields into sheep pastures than raising crops which had higher labor costs. But the environmental costs of wool short-term profits were undeniable. As an ecologist has noted, a large percentage of the exposed bedrock found in the region today owes its presence to past overgrazing by sheep. Uplands were left stonier every time their silty runoff choked streams and rivers the decline of hill farm culture loomed on the horizon. By the 1830s, westward migration had become a topic of widespread concern, as reflected in the advice of a Vermonter urging others not to sell off their lands to their rich neighbors for sheep pastures. But soon enough, many of the region's progressively run down hill farms would hardly be worth selling. After peaking in the early 1840s, the region's sheep population declined as many farmers turned to dairying to satisfy urban market growing urban markets. Essentially, local sheep farmers were rapidly outcompeted by their former neighbors who had moved out west, found fresh land, raised more sheep, and shipped the wool back to local factories at more competitive prices. As many during this time period observed, New England farms seemed to slide from the hills into the valleys. State census records in Rhode Island illustrate the gradual depopulation of interior hills and concurrent rapid increase of coastal populations. As the mid-century passed, country folk continued pursuing opportunities in cities, manufacturing towns, and the West. Consequently, the long-established habits and traditions of self-sufficient hill farms were quietly falling out of practice. Following the Civil War, state governments began grappling with the challenge of figuring out what to do with abandoned farmland. During the 20th century, states such as Rhode Island started acquiring it in massive amounts. Want to see the ruins of abandoned 19th century farmsteads locally, explore places like the Big River and Arcadia management areas. Now remember that by, the far, by far the greatest part of the westward migrants in the early to mid 19th century America were the sons and daughters of New England. And remember that the prairies and woodlands that develop, they developed into farms along western frontiers were originally inhabited by any number of tribal groups. It was Jacksonian democratic policy that helped facilitate the replacement of Western tribes with white male farmers from the East. So as I see it, New England's vast abandoned agrarian landscape should remind us of two things. First, over farming caused a region-wide environmental collapse. Second, tribal people living elsewhere paid the price. 
To me, the ever popular reinterpretation of local abandoned farms, farmscapes as ceremonial infrastructure, not only unlikely, but a profoundly ironic dismissal of otherwise important chapters in American and especially Native American history. That's my nutshell context for why we have so much 19th century stonework in our forests. Now to my main topic, the stone heaps, the records of which I spent a lot of time looking for. One of the earliest accounts of stone heaps sited on farmland dates to 1822 in upstate New York. A tourist traveling near Milford facetiously drew this connection between ancient Egyptians and local farmers. People in this part of the country must be, of course, of Egyptian extraction. And by the way, stones are actually piled up in the fields in a pyramidical manner, which either proves the hypothesis, or clearly shows, that the Egyptians took the hint in the construction of their pyramids from our ancestors. Obviously, he was a hilarious journalist. Um, he marveled at the surplus of stone here, where in many places looked as if it had rained stones instead of water. His account suggests that impounding field stones within pyramids was one way famous farmers managed their surplus. A fascinating account dating to 1895 describes a stone heap site in Thompson, Connecticut. It reads, on the Josiah Dyke place in this region are a number of curious heaps of stones piled up without mortar into pyramids so well and so solidly built that although built 60 years ago, they're still in as good condition as ever, except where mischievous boys have torn them down. They were placed there over half a century ago by an uncle of the owners of the property. He was demented and spent his whole time in the fields, which are full of stones of all sizes, picking up the stones and placing them with great care in heaps, which tapered slightly and reached a height of six feet or more. The work was so well done that it became a wonder of the countryside and people came from far and near to look at the stone heaps. Now they remain in the fields, visible from the road, although their builder has long since passed away. A few and few of the farmers in the locality know their history. This account dates the construction of these heaps to the 1830s, and they were assembled from stones of all sizes, suggesting that any field stone would have been suitable to include. Their maximum height corresponds to the practical limits of an adult's reach when standing. And having been built with great care and tapered forms, the stones they contained were clearly intended to stay put. There are important social implications as well here. The so-called demented builder probably suffered from progressive cognitive impairment, the price many pay for longevity. In regard to this account, Stonewall historian Bob Thorson qualifies the heaps as a testament to dementia, proclaiming the therapeutic value of stonework and happily passing the time as a form of engagement with the world, even when one's mind is slip sliding away. Thorson also notes that, which I find fascinating, that the micro history of this demented builder faded away in only six decades. This account leaves us wondering why certain farmers would take such care in constructing multiple stone heaps rather than simply dumping them in one large sprawling pile. There may be several practical benefits, none of which conflict. Neatly piled stones occupy less space. Making multiple heaps on site minimizes transportation costs. Clearing land removes tripping hazards for livestock and protects farm equipment from damage. Furthermore, consolidating stones to small footprints expands available surface area for plant growth. Illustrating this last point, I found a fascinating account of a Vermont farmer who stated in 1883 that, quote, we pile all the stones in the pasture, causing two spears of grass to grow where only one grew before. Stone heaping was often relegated to children. Such work demanded little, if any, supervision and did not require draft animals or heavy equipment. An 1820 Vermont account mentions children who, seven years ago last spring, were at work together heaping stones in a field. Among them was a boy about 10 years old. The expectation for children to perform such work may have been strongly reinforced in some families. Extreme example is described in 1836 Vermont as reported a certain father was deeply convinced of the importance of forming his sons to habits of industry, he used to set them to pulling down heaps of stone and then putting them back again. He has been known to employ them many a day, alternate removing and replacing of stones. In childhood memories, stone heaping are colorfully related in an 1873 Vermont account. How well I remember, writes an ex-farmer, those warm, relaxing spring days on the old farm 
when I was just large enough to pick up stones. What tedious, dull, back aching, hand rasping, boy disheartening days those were. But I do not remember what force it gave us boys when we were told in the morning, boys pick up a dozen good large heaps of stone and then go a fishing for the rest of the day. Throughout the 19th century, consolidation, mechanization, and specialization came to signify progress against, across all industries, including agriculture. Accordingly, it should come as no surprise that the traditional labor practices of small family farms became stigmatized as inefficient and perhaps even shameful. Farmers who left stone heaps strewn about their fields in plain view triggered a number of progressive-minded critics. In 1837, a Maine writer suggested that the appearance of stone heaps and mowing fields is a signature of farmers who disregard common maintenance. And in 1872, Vermont writer bluntly insisted that progressive farmers do not leave small skeeps scattered over their fields. If stone heaping carried any practical value on working farms, which of course it must have, progressive critics appear to have filtered all such information out of the public discourse. Of course, we know what filtering public discourse looks these days. So stone heaps were perhaps as controversial in the 19th century as they are today, but for entirely different reasons. Some critics attacked the personal character of farmers who generated stone heaps. An 1843 commentary argues that any farmers who mean to act up to the intelligence of the age are obligated to remove all such obstructions from their fields. Patronizing article from, the, from 1849, Vermont paper, insists that stones should never be accumulated in heaps in the fields because it is a slovenly practice. This sentiment is echoed in 1864 by a Vermonter who did not like to see the rocks picked up and left in heaps. He said it was a shiftless and thriftless way that spoils a good deal of land and makes bad work in the mowing. And in 1872, Vermonter writer uh, bluntly insisted that progressive farmers do not leave small skeeps. Okay, I think I already hit that one. By the close of the 19th century, this sentiment flavors a 1903, I'm sorry, I didn't, didn't read that. By the close of the 19th century, hill farmers were often regarded as backward facing reminders of an agricultural heyday. This sentiment flavors a 1903 article on the discovery of gold deposits in Bridgewater, Vermont. It reports, some of the people in this section are going wild over the reported discovery of gold here. Farmers who have piled up stones for years and years from their potato fields are now standing over some of these same stone piles with the clubs whenever anyone appears who looks like a geologist. I wonder if the scene looked anything like this 1870 image from Lincoln, Vermont. The image of club wielding farmers defending their stone eats from gold prospectors may be amusing, but it is also condescendingly insulting. From such an angle, stone eats would seem to stand in passive defiance against some progressive gaze. However, by the late 19th century, the societal turbulence of the industrial age had pressurized a nostalgic undercurrent through popular culture. Under these circumstances, stone heaps reminded some of the good old days of subsistence farming. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, stone heaps remained familiar elements of New England scenery and were still widely recognized as the handiwork of farmers, though from prior generations. For instance, a New Hampshire resident wrote that he owns a woodlot of about 100 acres with a well-built cellar hole, while all through the woods are the eternal little stone piles that meant hard work in clear mowing. A Vermonter similarly reported owning a reserve of pine timber in what once constituted an old field. He noted the visibility of rock heaps among the pines and an old cellar hole over which a numerous family of boys and girls were born. In 1910, a Maine resident recalled heaping stones when he was a young farmer. In regard to the latest winter weather, he wrote, this to some extent implicates the month of January, 1876. When the snow went off and the writer picked up a field of stone heaps, since turned into pasture, but the stones are there yet to remind us of this fact. In 1888, Rhode Island's Providence Journal published a letter arguing that the state's extensive abandoned farmlands should be brought back into cultivation. Its author characterized much of these lands as covered with stone piles that stand moss grown and covered with briars among oak trees that have the growth of a lifetime when men on the verge of 80 
uh, hoed corn and potatoes in their boyhood. If this context is accurate, that boyhood work took place around the 1820s. For an idea of what stone heaps looked like without overgrowth, we might refer to this undated photograph of Woodvale Farm, in, which is now part of the University of Rhode Island's Alton Jones campus in West Greenwich. This farmstead looks remarkably similar today, except that the stone heaps have long since been removed. Stone heaps are even evoked as nostalgic rural imagery in a short story published in 1891. It was a small town parable titled To the City and the Sad Homecoming of a Wayward Boy. When the story's headstrong New England boy left his good home for the city, the narrator, narrator laments, farewell to the broad rough uplands with familiar stone heaps dotted over. The boy tragically returned the following year in a casket after the city ground him up and spit him out. We may never know what percentage of the region's field stones were quite literally ground up and spit out for road building in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Reportedly, farmers were demanding pay for the stone heaps that dot their fields in response to the scarcity of freestone near where the crushed stone is being used. One source states, there are in all directions in this town piles of stones on various farms, which the owners at their own expense would gladly draw to the road, providing the stone when crushed was used in the roads in their vicinity. It is remarkable that the farmers don't move in this matter. One Vermonter even predicted that a generation hence, there will doubtlessly be but comparatively few stone walls or piles of stones scattered about the fields to be seen. They will either be in drains or used for permanent road making. Fortunately, early road building projects did not provide landowners with enough incentive to completely eliminate their stone heap sites. Modern observers have reported them from every New England state in New York state and even further regions as well. If these accounts explain, and, and there's more than that, it's just, I had to cut it short because I've only got so much time. If these accounts explain the abundance of stone heap sites in New England forests today, what does that mean? It means that we have identified an order, ordinary strain of knowledge that dropped from collective memory. It means we forgot that stone heaps once embodied the pragmatism of hill farmers keeping their degrading fields productive. And we forgot that stone heaps were disdained by self-styled progressives who enjoyed arguing against a caricature of backward hill farmers. And we forgot that stone heaps became objects of quiet reflection for certain industrial age folk. Of course, our society cannot be faulted for forgetting ordinary information after it has lost social relevance. That's how collective memory works. Nor can our society be faulted for reinterpreting seemingly mysterious stone features according to the cultural logic of our day. That is how people make sense of the world around them. Um, also note, um, some ceremonial stone landscape proponents believe that everything I just shared is settler colonial propaganda aimed at suppressing hidden truths about indigenous history and heritage and that I should be stopped. For the record, I support their right to have those thoughts and to share them openly with the public. Propaganda or not, everything I just shared will be published in a forthcoming issue of a peer-reviewed journal. This brings us to part two of my presentation. Okay, we're making good time, all right. By the 1940s, New England had become roughly 70% 70, 70 reforested. In the golden age of hill farming, had receded into the past on the order of a century. This led to what I refer to as the algebra of mystification. Basically, farms get overgrown and turn into forests, ordinary, ordinary memories finally fade into the distance, and then what remains becomes mysterious. That's the algebra. It was during this decade, the 1940s, that a mystical approach toward the interpretation of farm ruins sprouted among a handful of intellectuals. One of the sparks inspiring a radical revision of New England history was the book published by William B. Goodwin, an insurance executive, and Malcolm D. Pearson, a professional photographer, titled The Ruins of Great Ireland in New England. They were promoting a theory that mysterious looking stone ruins across the region were built by pre-Columbian European visitors. Their vision captured some of the public's imagination with antiquarian societies being founded in the 1960s dedicated to its pursuit. The most successful of these societies, which is still active today, 
is the New England Antiquities Research Association, hereafter referred to as NERA. Debates over mysterious woodland stonework really heated up in the 1970s. Archaeologists rejected the old world explanations provided by the antiquarians time and time again, and some became so frustrated that they began to see archaeologists as enemies. Two developed an apparent solution. One was James Maver, an oceanographic engineer from Woods Hole, and the other Byron Dix, an optical systems designer. They argued that these ruins were not left by ancient Europeans, but by Native Americans. They flipped the original antiquarian script on its head. Bear in mind that the 1970s was a time when Native Americans were politically revitalizing in American society, and other Americans looked toward them more romantically than ever, often with a dash of New Age mysticism, anti-establishment sympathy, and cultural guilt. The ideas that Maver and Dix were pioneering carried overtones of racial justice and seemed to automatically place them on a higher moral ground than archaeologists. They became rising stars within NERA as the 1980s progressed. Their 1989 magnum opus, the book Manitou, became the antiquarian's New Testament. It laid out the following assumptions, which formed the core of what would become ceremonial stone landscape theory. First, most of the dry laid stonework in New England's contemporary forests is pre colonial, astronomically oriented, ritual landscape architecture constructed by Native Americans. Under the covert protection of Native Americans and white sympathizers, much of the stonework survived colonial era landscape abuses. Today, these truths are only evident to intuitively perceptive individuals who are willing to embrace what you might call a sixth sense. Mainstream historians and archaeologists lack this sense and function to obscure the truth. During the 1990s, several NERA members enthusiastically embraced and promoted the countercultural vision laid forth in Manitou. Though they published articles for their peers, they were not gaining traction among the public. However, a very outspoken antiquarian, Mark Strohmeyer, attempted to take Maver and Dix's ideas to the next level. As I see it, the first ceremonial stone landscape preservation campaign was the modest one Strohmeyer launched in 1995 as the town of Carlisle, Massachusetts planned to develop a property known as the Conan Parcel. Public Archaeology Laboratory was called in to perform a professional archaeological survey headed by Alan Levely. Strohmeyer asked the town to allow him to join in on the survey as an informant. Carrying a copy of Manitou, he showed Levely features that he claimed were ceremonial, including a boulder that he said had a face on it and a stone heap that he claimed was used for a winter solstice ceremony. Another local antiquarian who had read Manitou psychologist whose credentials included being trained in visioning by a Cherokee medicine person meditated on the property. She concluded that it was used for the spiritual instruction of Native American children and that the stone walls were actually ceremonial stone roads. Now my politically unfiltered question to you is what municipal officials are going to preserve a Native American ceremonial complex based on its identific identification by white visionaries? not the town officials of Carlisle. They accepted the results of Levely's report, which concluded that the property contained farm ruins. The bottom line is that such antiquarians by themselves did not carry the cultural authority or moral legitimacy to have their ideas become political realities. But different antiquarians would return to Carlisle one decade later to challenge the same archeologist concerning the same sorts of stone phenomena. It was almost like a controlled sociological experiment, but one key variable would be different. The antiquarians would bring tribal representatives, representatives who carried the cultural authority and moral legitimacy necessary to turn the tide. The groundwork was laid in the early 2000s by Jack Davis, a forester and landscape designer living in Carlisle, who learned that the woods and fields behind his house, owned by a Mr. Benfield, was slated for development. His associate, Peter Waxman, who was also a published NERA member, encouraged him to use, quote, Indian archaeology, unquote, as a way to stop the development. Davis called tribal officials repeatedly, inviting them to look at the stonework near his house. In early 2003, one of those offices answered, after which a team formed around a handful of Southern New England tribal officials. The team included NERA-affiliated antiquarians and Curtis Hoffman, an anthropology professor from Bridgewater State University. 
After several walks in the woods, the tribal officials reportedly became convinced that most of the stone were pointed out by their new associates was indeed ceremonial. Later that year, a tribal official contacted the Native American Congress, known as the United South and Eastern Tribes, to get a resolution passed acknowledging that ceremonial properties exist in eight Massachusetts towns. Waxman claims to have come up with this list of eight towns himself. Ideas that had long been cultivated among antiquarians appear to have been making their way into tribal historic preservation during this time. This team's test came in 2005 when the Benfield Parcel A property was surveyed by the Public Archaeology Laboratory on the direction of Alan Lovely once again, who found much of the same phenomena he had found on the Conant Parcel exactly a decade earlier stone heaps, stone walls, and boulders. And he concluded, as before, that these represented parts of an abandoned farmscape. The tribal antiquarian team produced its own report, claiming that the stonework was ceremonial and should be preserved as such. Tribal representatives made it clear that not accepting their claims at face value would fit into a centuries-long tradition of bigotry. And in a spoken statement to the press, one suggested the town may face a lawsuit if this were to be the case. A story soon appeared in the Boston Globe, which brought this affair into public view. Now, my politically unfiltered question to you is, what municipal officials are going to disagree with Native Americans bearing charges of bigotry, religious oppression, and legal threats? Not those of Carlisle. They, they set aside the ceremonial area for permanent protection. The tribal authorities involved had exercised a new type of land claim that could be broadly and easily applied to most of the region's forested landscapes. This was the first of many similar campaigns to come. The most politically consequential was in 2008 at the Turner's Falls Municipal Airport in Montague, Massachusetts. It concerned the preservation of stone features on a hill where a runway expansion was planned. The features in question consist of what the Massachusetts Historical Commission identified as a farmer's unfinished stone wall, replete with piles of stones near the end that was left in progress. The federally recognized tribes involved interpreted the same as archaeoastronomical features that were part of a vast complex extending along a sacred alignment running from Fort Drum, New York to Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Keeper of the National Register of Historic Places cited exclusively with the tribal interpretation, determining that the Turner's Falls Sacred Ceremonial Hill site was eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. After that, Ceremonial stone landscapes would not remain an obscure paradigm. It would expand into a greater social movement. From here, I'll report on some dimensions of this movement as it has come into practice over the past decade. Two parallel universes now exist in cultural resource management. If you have a hill featuring stone walls, stone heaps, and perhaps a root cellar, archeologists conclude that they're in the presence of a historic farmstead. Some tribal authorities may interpret the same as comprising a ceremonial stone landscape. So projects requiring section 106 consultations overseen by federal agencies have tried to accommodate this new situation in good faith. Clients with stone structures on their properties often solicit a report with management recommendations from a professional archeologist and a separate one from tribal authorities. And the findings and management recommendations of the re those reports may be fundamentally incompatible. Some of these early tribal reports were generated by Technology Integration Group of Carlisle, Massachusetts, which conducted ceremonial stone landscape mapping for regional tribal historic preservation offices. That company is a light and optics technologies firm that was run by antiquarian Tim Full, who you may remember was involved in the Benfield Parcel A affair. In 2014, Ceremonial Landscapes Research, LLC, of Massachusetts was incorporated to work with federally recognized tribes in the tribal process of mapping, describing, analyzing, and preserving ceremonial landscapes identified by the tribes in accordance with the National Register of Historic Places standards. Its staff includes a registered professional archeologist in addition to antiquarians. Ceremonial stone landscape recognition and preservation has moved into what political scientists call the Overton window. You may have read, be running into that term. It's, it's coming up a lot in the media, so it's a good one to be familiar with. This is based on the idea that when enough popular support exists for a given idea, 
it can become public policy. As you can see, many federal and municipal agencies have incorporated ceremonial stone landscape recognition and preservation into their agendas and policy statements. So Native Americans unlocked this movement's political success. Antiquarians would still like to register their thoughts and contributions. By 2017, numerous pro-ceremonial stone landscape websites had appeared. I have difficulty seeing how their often conflicting information could form a unified theory, but the public is consuming it nonetheless. Consider this quote from top-ranked blogger Peter Waxman about the success of his website. Quote, Google gets its own ideas baked into its own definition of relevance, and 11 years of rock piles blogging has convinced Google this is the source for information about such things. No conventional wisdom, academic view will ever catch up. So far as the internet is concerned, rock piles are antiquities left by Native Americans for ceremonial purposes. It says so on the Google. Questioning the ceremonial stone landscape paradigm provokes accusations of racism. I published articles presenting alternative perspectives and it's called racist, jingoistic, arrogant, colonial, and evil. Most such insults were delivered by white male activists who seemed to consider themselves special defenders of Native Americans. One sent me a threatening message before I gave a talk on a stone-related topic. Journal editors told me, multiple journal editors, that they have been contacted by antiquarians attempting to protest and or preempt further publication of my research. Clearly, some within this movement do not want to take my ideas seriously, which is perfectly fine. What is not, what is not fine is attacking my reputation and trying to keep my ideas from reaching anybody else. Honestly, part of the reason I feel obligated to continue sharing my ideas on this topic is to demonstrate to the public that one does not have to submit to these sort of antics. Some residential landowners use ceremonial stone landscape claims to contest neighboring developments. When you see those claims negotiated on the municipal level, read the media coverage and all of the public documentation. You may recognize a certain drama triangle at work. Property of Butters cast Native American groups as the oppressed, themselves as their defenders, and the developers as oppressors. Now the thing about the Cartman drama triangle, a model I've borrowed from psychology, it's that it functions to escalate the emotional, emotional content of discourse, bypass facts and reasons. It is a model of social dysfunction. See how intense this drama triangle can get. Look into the ceremonial uh, landscape preservation campaign that occurred in the otherwise small and quiet Massachusetts town of Shutesbury from 2016 to 17. To me, this did not look like a step forward for white and native race relations. It looked like a step backward but don't take my word for it. There is an abundance of media coverage and publicly downloadable municipal records for you to pour through and think about on your own. I am fascinated by how professional archeologists and scholars are responding to the ceremonial stone landscape movement. Predictably, most are saying as little as possible about it. However, some have spoken up to suggest that the main barrier to the flourishing of ceremonial claims is the racially ignorant attitudes of the less enlightened peers. In my view, they almost seem to assume the role of defenders of Native Americans in the Cartman drama triangle. Consider this quote from an archeologist in regard to the age of a piled stone feature. You'll never convince redneck archeologists that that date's associated with this thing. Maybe you don't need to, because the number of redneck archeologists I think is getting smaller and smaller. He suggests the real problem ceremonial stone landscape recognition faces is not evidentiary or theoretical, but a fading generation of racially biased archeologists. Another scholar defends potential ceremonial claims by taking a critical posture towards potentially skeptical contract archeologists. We see claims seek comfort in the practical, perhaps safer interpretation of all stone features as related to white farming practices, aiming at purification clear the land for more developments. He seems to be scolding professional archeologists for finding so much of the farm ruins that one would otherwise expect them to find. 
and seems to cast that outcome as a form of what one might call today systemic racism. Or consider the statement from a history professor. The very questioning of ceremonial stone landscape claims can be seen as a retrenchment of anti-tribal ways of thinking and seeing. While I presume the statement's message was intended to carry positive value, that value does not include clearing a path for critical any sort of critical discussion. On the contrary, it dropped a roadblock of racial anxiety in the way of any non-tribal person who might have an important and potentially productive question to ask. Some archaeologists suggest centering the very language we use towards stone things in the woods. For example, two contract archaeologists have pledged to avoid using terms like Karen or chamber in their research according to their disrespectful, racist, or imperial undertones. Consider this quote from another archaeologist. Over the past 350 years, Europeans have systematically separated Native Americans of Northeastern North America from their places of religious significance and ceremony. Disenfranchisement has taken the form of archeological identification of Aboriginal stone features as farmer's piles and root cellars. I think her point is that if you run across what appears to be a root cellar or a farmer's pile, you're morally obligated not to call them those things any longer on the off chance that you were wrong. Some academics are publishing ceremonial stone landscape research, which I encourage you to read. For example, Dr. Curtis Hoffman published the book, Stone Prayers. It's beautifully illustrated. I own my own copy. Doug Harris, former deputy tribal historic preservation officer of the Narragansett Indian tribe, and Dr. Paul Robinson, former Rhode Island state archeologist, co-published this article in Northeast Anthropology on the bottom right. So you can get that through interlibrary loan. But unfortunately, you cannot read the only doctoral dissertation in existence that, according to the available abstract, appears to employ ceremonial stone landscape theory. It is under a tribal moratorium until the year 2030. I think I, when, I got my, when I got my dissertation, I think we were supposed to have that stuff get published so other scholars could, you could enter the scholarly community with a contribution, uh, but times are changing. Two religious groups concerned with the honoring and preservation of ceremonial stone landscapes have declared themselves. The syncretic spiritualists of the Northeast declared their existence during the aforementioned preservation campaign in Shootsbury. They filed a lawsuit against several defendants claiming to have been persecuted and prevented from access in the proposed solar farm property for religious purposes. They claimed that their ongoing lack of access would cause negative health outcomes including death. The US pagans were declared by a ceremonial stone landscape proponent in her 2019 journal article. She defines US pagans as Euro-Americans who wish to honor ceremonial stone landscapes, but that they are living uninvited on indigenous land and therefore are faced with the ethical challenge of avoiding cultural appropriation. Her proposed solution? U.S. pagans are obligated to seek out Native Americans and secure their permission before engaging ceremonial stone landscape. As to which of the dozens of New England tribal groups are the right ones to ask would appear to be anybody's guess. So if there are stone heaps in the woods and an archaeologist is asked for their opinion about it, these are probably among the questions running through their head before they turn and run and don't answer it at all. Will I be making a property dispute even worse? Will I be branded as anti-tribal in professional and academic circles? Will a religious sect accuse me of being oppressive? Will activists call me racist and try to destroy my reputation? I don't think there is any mystery as to why such a highly charged political atmosphere has been generated around this movement. It is a socio-political force field, the perfect atmosphere for keeping any and all skeptics out of the conversation. Someday we may all discover a common ground of assumptions and interpretations regarding the stone heaps so commonly found in our forests, but I don't think we will get there if we don't work through some un uncomfortable questions first. Questions like, is the ceremonial stone landscape movement inventing history to fit a contemporary vision? Is this movement spreading public misinformation? Is this movement promoting a realistic vision of Native Americans? 
or a deeply romanticized one? Is this movement infantilizing contemporary Native Americans as the subjects of a white savior complex? Is this movement really having anti-racist effects in society or is it inflating racial anxiety between today's whites and Indians? Thank you, I will leave you with those questions. And good, we have, uh, I think we have time for a few from the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, it's now time for you to ask Tim some questions if you would like to. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the raised hand icon. You can find that down at the bottom of your screen on the right hand side. Um, it probably says reactions and if you click on that you'll see a big hand and you can raise your hand that way. Or if you're calling um, in by telephone and you want to raise your hand, um, you can um, press star nine. And the same thing will happen. We'll see your hand up with a question <coughs> on the screen. Um, Mary Brown has a question. Go ahead, Mary. Um, unmute yourself first. Okay. Um, yeah, interesting program. Um, I'm curious as to whether you've looked at other parts of what is now the US, right, or Canada. Do you find these kinds of stone heaps and other farming communities of the same era or even later in the same kind of uh, uh, places that might have the same type of environment where there's lots of stones? <laughs> well, you know, I haven't done a big nationwide comprehensive search and that's a, a, a great a great thing to do and there's probably people doing it right now. I can say if you want a bellwether of figuring out where all the stone heap sites are, Follow this. Follow the ceremonial stone landscape movement. Uh, it's spreading uh, to different regions. Um, it's spread throughout New England. I got a call from Nova Scotia two months ago saying people are into this now here. Uh, it's moved into Pennsylvania a couple of years ago. It moved into West Virginia. And the things that all of those areas have in common is they all have abundant stone pile sites on them. So as the, as the movement moving, it's, it's kind of a, a social documentation of where these things still exist. So that would be an interesting way to track it. Um, I haven't really done, um, you know, full nationwide search uh, of this up. You know, I, I looked early on, I did some research in Europe and, you know, there's various parts of Europe where they have very similar uh, stone heaping, formerly farmed land that are, that are covered with stone heaps and cairns. Um, there's, there's one interesting area in the border, border of Finland and Russia. There's a park where they, Russian dude did a survey of this whole area and it's just like a New England stone heap site these large piles filled with smaller ones with larger ones to hold them in on the outside, evenly spaced across the landscape. It's a great paper, uh, poorly translated into English. And I've reached out to Russia, these people repeatedly, and I, apparently maybe they, they've got me filtered out. I can't reach Russia apparently, but um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. Okay, thank you. Who else, who else has a question? Anybody else? Linda. Why did you get interested in this subject to begin with? Um, that's a good question. It, you see, the, the funny thing, I'll, I'll, I'll give you two, point, two points in time here. The first point was when I, when I said to myself, I will never be interested in this. And <laughs> that was uh, the Carlisle 2, the Benfield Parcel A survey. Uh, I was out there with Alan Levely for part of that. And I remember I was on that and I remember hearing... You know, an, astro an, astronomer, an astronomer came out and told us that this is all ceremonial, you know. And, and then uh, the negotiation started. And I, I really, I had, this was a long time ago. I, I was still young, green. I had no idea what was going on, but I was going back to graduate school. And I remember kind of telling Alan, have fun with all this. I'm going back to school. I'm going to be teaching. I don't know what's going on here, but you've got it from here, buddy. Um, little did I know, I would come back and be a regulator in the world of archaeology. And uh, the first, actually the first question I was given when I came to the Rhode Island Historical Preservation and Heritage Commission was, can you study the stone pile thing? What is going on with this? You really need to look at this. Um, so that's really what we started off, 2012, I was told, you need to start looking at this more because this is a, this is a major current issue. We need to understand it better. Um, and then I just kept sort of running with it because the, inf the information you find is, when you get in, in, interested in the topic is, you know, I'm on the spectrum. I get hyper-focused on stuff and I, I became hyper-focused on this topic. 
and I'm ready for a new one. I look forward to having something else I can get more, sink my teeth into. Did you, did you ever meet or run into William Simmons, who is a, an anthropologist with a big background of Indians in Rhode Island? Um, I never got to speak to him. Uh, I'm a fan of his scholarship and uh, I, uh, I have a massive amount of respect for him and his career and everything he achieved. Um, but I never did get a chance to talk with them. I think I would have been intimidated. It would have been. No, I don't think so. It would have been interesting to, to hear his opinion. Yeah. Thank you. Someone else have a question? Anyone else? Questions? No questions? I don't see any hands raised. You might be zoomed out. I've had multiple Zoom meetings today. Yeah, everybody <laughs> might be zoomed out. You're right. Um, okay. Um, oh, there's a question, Denise. Hi. Yeah. Okay. Um. So, at what point? I was trying to 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 thread your timeline. Did the Indians actually decide that yes, they they were our our ceremonial piles? It seemed that it went from. Um, kids in the fields is clearing fields because we know we have rocky fields to um ceremonial and and how did that happen oh well it, it's actually there's multiple streams of reasoning um that seem to be a, at work there and of course there are native american stone spiritual stone filing traditions that are that that there's a, an overwhelming amount of historical documentation for I didn't go over that stuff in this talk because I simply didn't have time to go over that. Okay. It's actually a fascinating, there's, there's, a, there's a voluminous accounts actually of that. Um, but as far as what I would call the ceremonial stone landscape paradigm, which was essentially developed by Maver and Dix, and that's that, that, that the stone walls and the farmsteads were kind of pre-existing infrastructure that Europeans came in and just inhabited. It was already there. That idea, which sort of became the ceremonial stone landscape paradigm, it was adopted exactly 18 years ago by tribal authorities. It was, it was in one year that that switch, that ideological switch appears to have happened. And I'm not coming up with that um, because uh, it's just something that I think. I've, I, I, I've researched as much blogs, as much uh, uh, you know, uh, oral uh, history accounts that the people have put themselves down on record for. Um, but there's the, this is external evidence I'm working with says 2003 was, was the beginning, 2005, was was the campaign that really sealed the deal. Um, but before that, um, you know, the the stony, the, the abundant stone heap sites that I think that the farmers made most of, with the large, mostly of the large stones in them, um, those had been reinterpreted by the early 20th century. They're being widely reinterpreted by a lot of people as Indian graves that uh -huh. were in Indian bodies beneath. And a lot of Native Americans, uh, that became part of their oral tradition and their beliefs. And I'm not saying it's wrong. And there are Native Americans buried underneath stone piles. They just happen to be located just outside of New England where that's happening and it's been found. I mean, I would love, I would love to, uh, there's been no shortage of, of sort of one of the mill hilltop stone pile sites. I'm not aware of, of any producing any grave goods or, or human bones yet. And let me, let me tell you, there's been no shortage of people conscious People have been looking for that for a hundred years. They basically hmm. finally, finally stopped. People aren't, are finally, uh, there's, there's no, there's no bodies under these things. Yeah, um, but they're <laughs> ceremonial though, or markers for some event to come out, like commemorative. That's what I, I, you know, I had understood that if they are a stone pile and that was an if, they, some of them could be rock piles from farmers and some of them could be ceremonial, but you have to bring the tribe in to be able to tell the difference. Well, of course, nobody, nobody should be speaking for the tribes uh, without a doubt. Um, I think there's a lot of people extremely eager to sound like they're speaking for tribes. And, and I, find that, I find that strange. I find that psychologically very telling, sociologically telling. Um, but yeah, the tribes should be speaking for themselves on these things. And I can't tell you everything that's sacred to tribes. I just, I tend to think what happened agriculturally in New England was a giant a giant land quake. I mean, they were stumping, dragging, plowing, grazing, rearranging stone. It was a catastrophe that happened across the surface. If there's ancient ceremonial deposits of stones piled and heaped up, it's my perspective that we're looking for 
a needle in a haystack situation. But I think there's a lot of people now, the, the ceremonial stone landscape paradigm tends to see the haystack as being made of the needles. So we're in, we're, we're sort of working in, in parallel, different ideological universes, completely different assumptions. Hmm. Is how I put it. It's, it's a matter you. of, our, our ideas of proportionality are very different. Proportionality is what separates us mostly. But, hmm. Thanks. Anyone else have a question? No other questions? Last call for questions. No questions? Okay. One other question. Oh, somebody had a question. Someone have a question? I hear someone. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. Okay. Oh, Michael. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, my question is uh, are there places that the, the land just can't be farmed and it's it's clearly not farmable land where there are any of these stone structures but that was all of Rhode Island <laughs> <laughs> you know that's a, an extremely that is a really good question and that's a question I actually put in a peer reviewed peer, peer reviewed journal in 2013 basically exactly as you said it and 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 I thought you know that's the question I put out there I said if people are really looking for stuff, the best chances of finding ancient stone arrangements is if you can find intact forest that was never cleared, primary forest that was never farmed. I don't know. I have an idea where, it was, where there's some areas, but to my knowledge, there hasn't been any systematic attempts to locate the old forest growths and, and systematically comb over these things and look for that kind of activity. And that, like, from a, from a, a scientific perspective, that is a, a fantastic premise for a funded study, in my opinion. Thank you. I see a hand. Is that Bill or Sarah? No, oh, it's out. Oh, no. No, I don't see one. Anyone yeah, else have a question? On, it was on mine. Oh, okay. Anybody okay. else? No questions? Well, Tim, that was great. Thank you so much. It was really fascinating and thought provoking, that's for sure. And hopefully you will return to the museum with another fascinating research project as soon as you decide on something. Um, and um, we're going to be posting a recording of this program on our website. Um, if you check back in a few days, you'll be able to find it there if anyone would like to watch it again or if you know someone who would like to see it quite a bit of information, you might wanna review it again. So uh, we look forward to seeing many of you on May 6th for our final spring presentation with John Pino as he discussed it, discusses Shepherd Tom Hazard, industrialist, social reformer and spiritualist in his home Val Close in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. So we appreciate seeing you all of you tonight on Zoom. Thank you, Karen, as our as for hosting our program again. And until uh, we meet again, good night and stay safe. Good night, everyone. Thank good you. Night. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Tim. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.